talks over 12 weeks. We hope that the, the topics and the speakers will be of relevance to you, whether you be a clinician or a scientist. Um, and really a big thank you to Teresa Rousseau, who has been the, the main brains behind putting the program together. Um, thank you to Immunopedia for hosting and our sponsors in Carver. Uh, and looking forward to a fantastic lineup um, of speakers and topics. So I'm going to hand you back to Johnny to introduce the speakers. Uh, thank you, Melinda. Um, so yes, we, today we've got uh, two talks. Um, they're going to each be uh, around about 25 to 30 minutes. They are themed around the issue of humoral immune response to SARS-CoV infection and also related to that serology testing. Um, and just to highlight as well, there are a Q&A box for people wanting to ask questions. Um, there's also a chat box. Both of them are live. But if you want to direct questions to the speaker, please put them into the question and answer box. And I will be uh, monitoring this. And at the end of each talk, uh, we'll try to ask two or three questions that are the most popular. So also, if you see somebody um, put a question and you agree with it, like it and those will move up to the top. So we'll try to ask the sort of three most popular and pressing questions to each of the speaker. So our first speaker for this afternoon is Professor Penny Moore. Um, she is a South African research chair. She holds this chair in virus host dynamics um, and an associate professor at the University of Witwatersrand, South Africa, um, and also the NICD. Uh, she's also a joint appointment uh, as an honorary senior scientist in virus host dynamics at Caprisa, University of KZN. Um, she works largely focused in the field of HIV vaccine discovery, and many of you will know her from that uh, area, where she combines virology and immunology. Um, these techniques and platforms are highly applicable to, to the study of SARS-CoV-2 research, um, and so this is how this connects uh, to this field. So we'll start there and hand over to Penny. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, the, the first challenge, of course, is, is sharing my slides, which is always a... Can you see them? Yeah. Great. Uh, so, yeah, thanks very much, everybody, for joining us. Um, so my, my task is to try and uh, talk you through whether or not and how we um, are able to characterize immunity to SARS-CoV-2. Um, oh. Right, um, and I thought I'd start um, probably completely unnecessarily, but reminding you uh, how we got here um, with the recent emergence and rapid global spread of SARS-CoV-2 and the resulting disease COVID-19, which has really created a completely unprecedented health crisis with um, huge social and economic implications for the whole, for the whole globe. Um, the origin of SARS-CoV-2, um, as I'm sure all of you know, can be traced to the city of Wuhan in the province of Hubei in China. Uh, where a cluster of viral pneumonia cases was first detected. And China reported the outbreak to the World Health Organization in December 2019, which feels like an age ago now, and um, soon after that identified the causative virus as a beta coronavirus, uh, the seventh to be able to infect humans, with um, very high sequence homology to bat coronaviruses. Um, and those are, that bat bats are assumed to be the causative, the, the reservoir of these coronaviruses, so there's likely to be an intermediary um, that's yet to be completely nailed down. Um, SARS-CoV-2 was subsequently declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization on March um, 11th, 2020, um, literally months ago now. And I guess what's really been um, incredibly striking has been the, the scientific response to this pandemic, which has been totally extraordinary, and I think we'll likely change our reaction to emerging pathogens forever, I think. Um, the laboratories across the world have um, refocused all their energy and resources to SARS-CoV-2. And I think the amount of knowledge that's been generated um, for an entirely new virus over what is literally months now um, is unprecedented. I and mean, we've, we've learned a huge amount about this virus. Um, we've shared data as a field in a way that I don't think has ever quite been seen before with data being generated fast, um, reviewed incredibly fast for good or for bad, um, put onto preprint um, servers very quickly to inform public responses. Um, the field has shared reagents and protocols faster than I think has ever been seen before. Um, vaccine preparedness has happened faster than we've ever seen before. And I think really it's going to change 
the way we do science um, when it comes to pathogens going forward. Um, this is what the numbers look like. Well, this is what the numbers did look like uh, yesterday. Um, we had 17, well, nearly 18 million confirmed cases across the world. This is from the WHO dashboard. Uh, yesterday, 686,000 deaths. In South Africa, it was um, 511 lab confirmed cases and 8,300 um, deaths as of yesterday. And those numbers, as you're aware, just continue to, to climb constantly. And this is what the virus looks like. Um, it's um, the, the viral particles about 50 to 200 nanometers in diameter. It's an envelope particle. Um, it has a single stranded RNA genome um, that is about 30 KB. Um, it includes, it encodes um, non-structural replicase polyproteins, as well as um, four structural proteins, which I'm really gonna speak about mostly in, in, in this presentation. And these include I'm hoping you can see my mouse. Um, these include the spike glycoprotein here, the E protein, M protein, as, and those are embedded in the viral membrane um, that contains the viral particle, as well as the nuclear capsid that holds onto the RNA genome. And all of these structural proteins are um, encoded for by these green genes over here. And they're really going to be the focus of, um, of my talk today, mostly because they are the targets largely of the, of the immune response. And in particular, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is um, the spike here, the spike like protein, um, this large uh, protein that's shown down here at the bottom. So um, what do we know about the uh, kinetics of the early, of the, uh, of the antibody response to SARS-CoV-2? We know quite a lot about the early kinetics of the antibody response to SARS-CoV-2, and largely we know less about what happens later, and I'll touch on that um, further in, in the talk. And the reason for that is because um, it's simply too early in the pandemic to know what happens later on during infection. What we do know is that um, within days of infection, there's a rapid and near universal IgM response, normally within about seven or eight days of infection. That's the pink line that you can see here. And that's followed within a couple of days by an IgG and actually not shown here also by an IgA response. And that's similar to the kinetics of responses to what we see to many other coronaviruses. Um, by ELISA, antibodies to the nuclear capsid and the spike like of protein are very commonly detected. Um, we know less about what happens with M and E. In part, um, they have simply been less well studied, and that's partly because the, the antigens themselves are um, less easy to, to make, and therefore the, the field has focused less on um, understanding the antibody responses to those proteins. And the spike has really been a major focus for, for vaccine design. And the reason for that is pretty obvious when you when you look at the viral particles. Um, the spike is really what gives the coronaviruses their, their name, and you can see that when you look at this um, this picture of the viral particles from Monica Burkett at NICD. Um, the, the the spikes are what um, form that um, circle or the, the crown that gives the coronaviruses their name. That's the they they form that dense layer around the viral particles. Um, that um, the, they, they're so densely um, layered around the viral particles that that's actually what forms the corona of the coronaviruses. Um, these spike glycoproteins are um, homotrimers. They're heavily glycosylated, um, formed of the um, S1 and S2 subunits of the particle. Um, the S2 down here has the fusion machinery of the, um, that mediates entry. And this is the, um, the part of the virus that um, allows the virus to bind to the uh, cellular receptor, which is ACE2, um, and that, that interaction happens by this little red bit here at the top of the spike, um, which is called the receptor binding domain, and you will have heard a lot about that as you follow the literature um, regarding how this virus interacts with, with its receptors and with um, the various antibodies. Um, what has made it easy to uh, measure antibody responses to this particular protein is that both the entire spike glycoprotein and that receptor binding domain um, can both be fairly easily expressed as um, nice, clean, soluble, and in the case of the full uh, spike glycoprotein, very stabilized proteins. Um, and we've been able to express both of those in the lab, um, courtesy of um, very nice constructs that were kindly shared with us by uh, Florian Kramer and Jason McClellan. 
Um, and the fact that these uh, proteins express so nicely has really enabled the field to be able to measure very cleanly antibody responses to both the spike glycoprotein and the RBD. Um, and this is some of the results that um, I'm showing you here is uh, simply um, ELISA data using both the RBD and side and the spike against um, a series of SARS-CoV negative samples to show you the low levels of background that we see with these. Um, on the left hand side you can see um, some SARS-CoV-2 negative samples, recent samples collected between January and May of this year. Um, and you can see relatively low levels of background against both the RBD and the spike proteins. Um, and on the uh, the right hand side, um, following some reports um, that there was cross reactivity with HIV positive samples, we also screened the RBD and the spike proteins against um, historic serum samples from, in fact, from the Caprisa cohorts of HIV positive individuals. And these are all samples collected before 2011, just to make sure that there was no cross reactivity with either the RBD and the spike. And you can see very low, very low um, ODs, um, nice clean results for both the RBD and the spike. This is in um, stark contrast, as you can see here, to the levels of um, high, highly variable levels of reactivity um, to what you see when you test serum from SARS-CoV-2 um, PCR-confirmed positive um, individuals. This is serum samples from 162 individuals with PCR-confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, collected between April and June this year. Um, and you can see uh, these were samples collected between 3 and 79 days after their first PCR-positive test and a wide range of uh, reactivities against both the RBD and the spike protein. Um, perhaps some of these low level um, negative um, may be too early after, um, after infection to be, able to be detecting binding responses, but you can see a very wide range of responses. And this is very consistent with what other labs uh, see, lots of, lots of binding to both RBD and spike. We also see, and again, this is very consistent with what um, many other labs are, are seeing very good correlation between um, antibody binding responses to both the RBD and the spike. Um, if anything, you perhaps see high levels of binding to uh, the spike um, over the RBD, which is consistent with the fact that it's, it's huge compared to the tiny little RBD. Um, so there are many more epitopes within the spike that might be recognized. But overall, you, you really get the sense that the RBD is highly immunodominant um, within, within this. Um, so really very tight correlation between these two proteins. So um, all of this data that I've shown you up to now has um, all been binding antibodies. Um, and uh, Elizabeth will speak, I think, a lot more about these binding antibodies and, and their, their usefulness in diagnostics. And, um, and undoubtedly, they have a role there. But I guess we're where my, my interest is, is more in terms of neutralizing antibody responses. So neutralizing antibodies are a small uh, subset of binding antibodies and they um, are of great interest because they, they're the types of antibodies that are able to prevent a, a virus from being able to enter a host cell. Uh, they neutralize the virus, they prevent it from being able to enter. And from a, from a vaccine perspective, those antibodies are of great interest, obviously. Um, and so I'm going to move on uh, now and tell you a little bit more about the neutralizing antibodies in um, convalescent donors. So me measuring neutralizing antibodies is a little bit more complicated than uh, measuring uh, binding antibodies. And that turns out to be particularly the complicated in the case of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And it's been um, difficult to um, measure these neutralizing antibodies. Um, in general, the field is using two different approaches to, to measure neutralizing antibodies. And I'm, I'm going to take you uh, through the two because um, it, I think it's probably important to understand the differences, uh, the, the advantages and disadvantages of the two types of assays um, because they're being used in many different studies um, and the, the implications are important to understand. So um, people tend to use either um, live virus neutralization assays um, and people who use them refer to them as authentic. Um, neutralization assays, um, where they're using clinical isolates passaged often in Vero cells. And that's one, one platform. Um, and the second platform is using what's called um, SARS-CoV-2 spike pseudotype viral particles. Um, in this case, often using retroviral uh, backbones, often HIV-based platforms. And in this case, what, uh, what it is is a, a viral um, particle that expresses the SARS-CoV-2 spike on the outside. And that viral particle is capable only of a single round of infection. So the, the particle can infect a target cell. Um, it has a readout um, that measures the level of infection, but it's not capable of subsequent rounds of infection. Um, 
there are advantages and disadvantages, and I've tried to capture some of the um, some of those here. So green is an, an advantage, and red is a disadvantage. Um, so um, certainly, the live virus um, neutralization assay could be seen as a more accurate representation of the virus, whereas the um, the type of virus and the type of spike on a pseudovirus um, pseudovirus particle probably needs to be better understood. For example. Um, whether the uh, spike glycoprotein is as densely populated on those virus particles and whether the level of glycosylation is the same is not um, known at this stage. Um, the live virus requires obviously BSL-3 containment facilities, whereas the pseudovirus, because it's only capable of a single round of infection, doesn't require those sort of facilities, so it's much safer. Uh, live virus assays um, are prone potentially to passage-related viral evolution, and that's something to bear in mind is that your virus can be changing over time. Whereas with the pseudovirus assay, what you get in, what you put in is what you get out, and that makes interpretation potentially easier. Um, the live virus assays have variable throughput, um, sometimes are much slower, whereas the pseudotype assays are, are much faster. So there's pros and cons to both assays, and I think this is why you'll find different, um, different studies are using both, um, depending on the need. But I guess the most important question is how do the outputs of the two assays compare with one another? That's shown on this slide here, which is uh, data taken from um, the recent study comparing, uh, looking at the immunogenicity of the chimp adeno vaccine. So these are not convalescent uh, Sierra, these are actually vaccine samples. But um, on the left-hand side, you can see the comparison of two live virus neutralization assays, and you can see the concordance between the two is pretty good. On the right-hand side um, is a comparison of the pseudovirus and the live virus neutralization assay. And again, in fact, in this case, even better concordance between the two assays. But what I wanted to draw your attention to is that the scales are very different. So while uh, a good neutralizing response in, in all assays is a good response, um, comparison of titers between the assays is more complicated. Um, so you can see that here assay, a titer of 4,000 is equivalent to a titer of 500 in the two different assays. And it's also important to note that there is some intriguing emerging unpublished data showing that different antibodies behave differently in different assays. So for an example, a monoclonal antibody that behaves well in one assay behaves badly in another. So definitely some intriguing differences that we'll need to tease out in these assays. Um, in our lab, we're using a pseudovirus neutralization base, uh, assay based on a HIV backbone um, expressing luciferase, and we're doing a readout in 293 T cells that stably express ACE2, the, the receptor for SARS-CoV-2. Um, which was kindly provided to us by Mike Farzan from Scripps. And we are seeing a very good correlation between neutralization, titers, and ELISA. And again, this is pretty consistent with what many other people are seeing across the world. This is data from uh, Florian Kramer's cohort in New York, and they too see very good correlations between uh, neutralization uh, titers and ELISA titers. Um, I think uh, and, uh, with exceptions here and there, but in general, there seems to be a very good correlation between those two assays. So who develops neutralizing antibodies? Well, as with, the, um, as, the, as with the binding antibodies, virtually everybody seems to develop neutralizing antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. Um, this is uh, data from a very large cohort in New York, um, nearly 20,000 individuals. Um, and the warmer the colors on the left-hand side in the pie chart, the better the neutralization. This was measured with a live virus neutralization. If anything, it um, understates the neutralization. You can see virtually everybody develop neutralizing antibody titers and in many cases to extremely high levels. Um, and just to make the point on the right-hand side that um, neutralizing um, antibody levels tend to be higher in people who are most ill. So this is a comparison in a cohort from London showing that um, people who are severely ill in red tend to develop much higher neutralizing titers than those who are less ill um, in black. And that again is an, an, emerging, an emerging theme. The fact that um, people, that all these people make such uh, very good neutralizing antibodies, of course, has um, led many, many groups to try to isolate monoclonal antibodies from um, convalescent donors, from plasma blasts or memory B cells, from, from individuals who have recovered from SARS-CoV-2 infection. And I've listed a few papers here, and uh, this is a graphical abstract from one of those papers. Um, many, many groups trying to isolate monoclonal antibodies now, um, with the idea of both characterizing and understanding the, the the um, neutralizing response to SARS-CoV-2 infection, but also to try to um, develop monoclonal antibodies as tools uh, to be able to use for treatment and prophylaxis in future, in, in future um, rounds of infection to try to protect people. Um, 
what has been nice to see is that um, people have been able to isolate incredibly potent monoclonal antibodies um, from very early on in infection, um, despite very low levels of somatic hypermutation. Um, there is evidence of germline preference in the sense that um, some immunoglobulin germline genes seem better able to deal with SARS-CoV-2, but there's substantial uh, plasticity, um, by which I mean that the immune system has um, lots, of, lots of scope, lots of different ways in which they can, uh, they can recognize SARS-CoV-2. Um, so this situation is very different to, to HIV. Um, I, I seem to have spent the last few years giving talks about how difficult it is for for the immune system to recognize HIV and make broadly neutralizing antibodies to HIV. And this is a very different situation. It seems much, much easier to make neutralizing antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, which is good news for HIV, uh, for SARS-CoV-2. And um, the, the ability to um, be able to pull out these monoclonal antibodies um, gives people scope to be really able to drill down and recognize, uh, to define very clearly what the epitopes are that are recognized by monoclonal antibodies. And what's become clear from these studies is that that RBD, the receptor binding domain, that little red, tiny little red part of the spike glycoprotein, protein is highly um, immunodominant. So this is um, a collection of monoclonal antibodies that were isolated from a convalescent donor about a third of the monoclonal antibodies were neutralizing um, that were pulled out of this donor, and 28 out of the 29 that were neutralizing antibodies recognized the RBD. And this is in stark contrast to the non-neutralizing antibodies pulled from the same donor, which recognize a whole array, array of different uh, epitopes on the spike uh, glycoprotein. So really the RBD is the major target for these neutralizing antibody responses. Another major question in the field um, has been how durable these SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing responses are. And this, this, of course, is critically important to understand from the perspective of uh, protection from reinfection. Um, it's probably too early in the epidemic to have clear answers, um, but we do have some clues um, from other coronaviruses. Um, and there's um, some emerging data coming out now as the epidemic uh, matures. From other coronaviruses, um, we know that um, the duration of neutralizing antibodies is fairly short-lived. Um, human coronavirus 229E neutralizing antibodies have been shown to wane fairly rapidly within a year of infection, although there's some residual protection from reinfection. Uh, MERS-CoV antibodies were detected in six of seven volunteers uh, three years post-infection, but they had uh, substantially waned at that stage. Um, and in studies of SARS-CoV-1, uh, the peak for neutralizing antibodies was very, very early at four months post-infection. And then people saw a really substantial decline two to three years post-infection with many individuals showing really undetectable levels of neutralizing antibodies um, thereafter. And SARS-CoV-2, um, I, I, I think people are still trying to get a handle on this. Um, and there's uh, mixed, mixed data coming out at the moment. This is a paper that came out last week arguing that, um, that neutralizing antibodies were relatively stable over three months. Three months is a fairly short, um, fairly short time frame, and even then I think you're starting to see a slight dip, but this is a um, comparison of day 30 and day 82. In contrast, um, two papers here um, argued, and I think show fairly compellingly, that the neutralizing antibody titers do decline um, within weeks, and of course that led to a whole flurry of alarming newspaper headlines about um, declining immunity and um, the fact that uh, everybody may be at substantial risk for reinfection. But I think, I think probably we, we, don't, we don't know the answer yet. Um, we don't know what neutralizing antibody titers are high enough to protect. Um, I mean, there are many, many examples of vaccines that protect it really, um, neutralizing antibody titers that are really very low. And um, we need to establish what the threshold of protection is for humans. If neutralizing antibodies are protective, which we don't know, but animal models suggest that they probably are, then we still need to establish what the threshold of protection is for humans. Um, and that will require longitudinal studies of reinfection with immunological readouts and viral sequencing, which are ongoing. And they will require viral vaccine correlates of protection, which are also ongoing. And the other thing that um, is really essentially unknown for coronaviruses in, in general, as far as I can tell, 
is the durability and quality of um, memory B cell responses, um, certainly unknown for SARS-CoV-2, but I think very little known in general um, for coronaviruses, and that's an area that I think we will need to understand much more to be able to understand what, what protection from reinfection will really look like. But in terms of vaccine responses, what we, what we can say is that uh, many of the vaccines that are currently being tested are eliciting neutralizing antibody titers that are in the range um, that we see with um, convalescent sera. So this is um, looking at the levels of neutralizing antibody titers that are elicited by the chimpan chimpanzee Adenauer Oxford vaccine that's being tested here in South Africa currently. So uh, the red, red uh, boxes and lines show you that the levels of neutralizing antibodies elicited by the vaccines and at the end there in green, you can see the um, levels of neutralizing antibodies elicited in convalescent plasma samples. And you can see that they're, by the end of the final boost, um, the vaccinees are, have similar levels of neutralizing antibodies to the convalescent um, plasma samples, which is good. And that is also true of the Moderna RNA vaccine, which maybe in fact elicits even higher neutralizing antibody responses compared to the um, convalescent plasma. Uh, donors. So, so that, that is good news in the sense that the vaccines are doing at least as well as infection, um, although we still don't know how that will translate to protection from infection. There are lots of other things we don't know. Um, we know very little about the role of FC effector function in coronavirus infections. Um, up to now I've spoken largely about uh, neutralization, um, but um, there, there are, as I've already mentioned, many non-neutralizing antibodies that are elicited Particularly to, particularly to nuclear capsidin and the spike glycoprotein, but their capacity for FC effector function has not been well defined. And those of you who join these global COVID lab meetings will have seen last week some really intriguing data coming out of Galit Alter's lab, um, a comparison of COVID-19 patients who went on to die um, comparing those who, who survived, which suggested a very, very distinct and very early um, FC effector and IgG um, IG isotype signature that distinguished survivors from non-survivors, which um, may suggest that uh, what happens very early on determines um, whether you go on to, to uh, deal well with the infection or not. I think another entirely unknown question is the question of antibody dependent enhancement. So I've already mentioned that, um, that people who um, become severely ill often have higher titers of neutralizing antibodies. Um, and this is similar to SARS-CoV-1 infection, um, which has led to the um, uh, speculation that um, there's increased pulmonary pathology through antibody dependent enhancement. And the idea here is that non-neutralizing immunoglobulins um, enhance virus entry into cells that express FC receptors, particularly macrophages and monocytes. And there is some evidence from studies in non-human primates that supports this. And then there's also emerging um, data showing, um, for example, the isolation of monoclonal antibodies that do show antibody-dependent enhancement. But it seems that the consensus at the moment is that there's no clear evidence yet of antibody-dependent enhancement in either SARS-CoV-2 infection or vaccination. Though again, it may be too early to, to know that. And the other thing that I think we know very little about is whether viral escape variants will impact on neutralizing antibody responses. Um, those of you who've, who follow um, the virology part of the story will have um, heard a lot about this 614 mutation. Um, it's, it made the press um, quite a lot in the last few weeks. And this is this um, mutation uh, that um, swept through the global uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, population a replacement of a, a 614D variant with a, a 614G variant, um, which was associated uh, potentially with increased viral loads and potentially with increased infectivity. Um, although I think the role of this mut mutation, which happens to sit within the, the spike lycoprotein, but not within the receptor binding domain, and um, the effect of this mutation on neutralizing antibodies is um, still, I think the jury's still out on that. Um, but, you know, as, as this pandemic matures, more and more of these mutations within uh, the spike glycoprotein and within all the other um, surface proteins will emerge and we'll have to track those mutations and understand their effect on, on neutralizing and other antibody responses. So uh, 
yeah, I, I guess in conclusion, I think we have the platforms in place for measuring many of the immune readouts and, and are developing many of the other um, systems to uh, measure, for example, FC effector function and um, antibody dependent enhancement. Um, it, most urgent, I think, will be to look at uh, durability and protective titers of neutralizing antibodies because that's key to understand the protection from reinfection. But there are many, many unknowns. Um, it's only in terms of humoral immune responses, let alone all the other immune aspects of this. Um, we need to understand better memory responses, um, the protective role of FC responses, the contribution of pre-existing immunity, which I haven't even re really touched on, impact of viral um, adaptation and the contribution of co-infections, just to list a few of the unknown questions. And there I'll stop. I um, uh, th thank our wonderful, um, slightly mad lab um, that I lead with Lynn Morris. Uh, our many um, collaborators who've helped us set up the various assays, um, many of them friends from the HIV world. Um, just to pull out um, the various people who've helped work on um, the SARS-CoV-2 ELISA and the neutralizing and the FC effector assays at, um, at, at the NICD, and then the many um, collaborators at NICD and elsewhere that have helped with this work. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Penny. I think we've got time for um, just one or two questions. Um, the first question we've got is from Tom Schreiber, um, which, which addresses a little bit um, about the, your, your thing about cross immunity, the last point you made in the conclusion there, which just says, have you looked at the degree of cross reactivity between antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 and seasonal coronaviruses, um, if any? Um, and is there any evidence for protection against COVID-19 by prior infections? Um, it looks like there's none from ELISA from healthy people, but is that really the case? So we haven't yet, uh, a, I mean, it's a great question. I think lots of, lots of people are interested in it. We haven't yet uh, looked at cross-reactivity to other common cold coronaviruses. But I think uh, the people who've looked um, are generally not seeing high levels of antibody cross-reactivity. I think where people are seeing much higher levels of cross-reactivities in the T-cell responses. Um, which obviously has implications both for directly for T cell protection, but also for priming of better B cell responses. So I think it's an area where there's a lot of uh, a lot of focus at the moment. Yeah, I think this is. Uh, thank you. I, I think uh, there's another interesting question here um, that I also had, um, which related to the convalescent antibody levels. You know, they seem to you get quite a lot of variation and the highest levels in uh, severe disease. Um, and the question that is being asked here by some Somobile is, is that suggestive that there's the protective role of IgG is limited in COVID-19? I, I want to add two other things from the clinical aspect is we happen to, in our ward, we happen to look after uh, a whole bunch of hematology patients that have had their B cells knocked out with rituximab. Um, and we're busy putting together a case series of that. But what was remarkable about them, just in summary, is how in a couple of them, they had completely asymptomatic disease and, and one patient actually died. So there was a huge spectrum, you know, even within this with, 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 without B cells largely. So I don't know what your comments are there, Penny. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I, and I guess it comes back to the, the timing. I think probably by the stage by the stage that you're looking at when people have been hospitalized, a lot of the, the damage has already been done. And, I, you know, I, I think it's difficult at that stage to to pull apart the, the role of viral loads in driving, driving antibody responses. So, you know, I think trying to disaggregate a neutralizing antibody response in preventing an infection from a, a neutralizing antibody response in controlling an infection after so much damage has been done is, is a different thing. So correlates of protection from preventing infection versus high levels of neutralizing antibody after um, you know, weeks and weeks of infection, I think are two very separate scenarios. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't think that there's strong evidence to suggest that neutralizing antibodies can be protecting people at that late stage of infection. Does that make, make sense to you? That makes entire sense. Um, I think we'll stop there because uh, we want to keep to time and we're going to move on to Elizabeth. So uh, maybe you wouldn't mind, Penny, there are a couple of questions still um, in, the, in the chat group um, and you can maybe just uh, type some answers to them as we progress. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. The next, uh, uh, thanks again. And the next uh, speaker I'd like to introduce is Associate Professor Elizabeth Main. Um, Elizabeth Main is a Associate Professor and Head of Academic Department of Immunology at the University of Witwatersrand. Um, her research interests are mainly on acute inflammation and also viral infections, immunology diagnostics and tumor immunology. Um, and Elizabeth is the principal investigator of the H3A biorepository uh, and also sits on the international executive of ISPA. Um, and she's passionate about immunology teaching uh, and training. And she's going to talk to us about serology testing uh, in South Africa. Is it ready for the prime time? So I'm handing over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, so, Johnny, I, I, I think Penny needs to stop sharing because I can't unfortunately share until she stopped. Ah, thanks, Penny. Okay. Um, so, let's hope that I can get this right as well. Um, as, as Penny did. Um, I hope everybody can see this. Yeah, we can see that. Wonderful. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so thank you very much. And thank you very much uh, to Penny. She's made my job a whole lot easier because uh, she's given us such a great introduction to the whole uh, um, world of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. Um, my talk is going to be very much more from a practical point of view, and I see that there are a number of pathologists and also some suppliers on, on, on this uh, webinar, which makes me slightly nervous. Um, so hopefully I don't misrepresent anyone. <clears throat> okay, so um, Penny's already said all of this. Um, I just wanted to highlight, because I saw that was one of the questions, was that there is obviously a relationship between SARS-CoV-2 with the the um, common coronaviruses, which cause about 30% of, of what we call the common cold. And then, as Penny mentioned, also the SARS-CoV-1 and the MERS virus. And, and I'm going to come to some of those cross-reactivities a little bit later on as well. Okay, <clears throat> but to start, and because I'm a monosynaptic clinician and uh, I, need to, uh, I need to put myself into context, I just wanted to talk a little bit from a theoretical point of view about what should be the optimal response to, uh, to a viral infection, especially something like an upper respiratory tract uh, viral infection? <clears throat> so as Penny has uh, just eloquently said, um, if you want to prevent infection, one of the things that we often look at are neutralizing antibodies. Uh, if you already have an infection, then often uh, the only way to eliminate a viral infection is to kill the cells which are infected by that virus. Um, and, and we have a number of ways of doing that. And um, as Penny's already mentioned, neutralization are those antibodies which block the receptor and stop the pathogen from gaining entry into a cell. Uh, it also works for other things like toxins. Okay, so typically um, when I'm talking about the immune system, I tend to divide it into the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. And this becomes very important from the clinical response uh, to SARS-CoV-2. So, if you're looking at the innate immune system, the innate immune system is um, I, I'm often, it's often said to me that it's the sort of initial immune system, but really it relates to pattern recognition. And it often recognizes non-mammalian patterns. And in the case of viruses, those patterns are often um, non-mammalian patterns of uh, nucleic acid. And some of the earliest responses to this are release of pro-inflammatory cytokines like uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin-6, as well as stimulation of the acute phase response, um, and activation of lymphocytes with specific functions like natural killer cells, which are important for killing virally infected cells. And then the innate immune system really lays the groundwork for the adaptive immune response to the virus through formation of what we call the immunological synapse. Now, the innate immune system is what makes you feel terrible when you have um, a viral infection. So uh, a lot of those responses that you feel when you have a cold, uh, the sickness behavior, uh, not wanting to get out of bed, uh, not wanting to eat, feeling tired, lethargic, pain, etc., are often results of um, specific interactions of these pro-inflammatory cytokines with um, receptors, especially in the brain. Okay, so taking up the adaptive immune response, and this is again, just at a very basic level, 
Um, this is going to be coordinated by the CD4 positive T cell, also called the helper T cell. And the CD4 positive T cell will then stimulate two different wings, and I'm going to uh, get in trouble for oversimplification, but often we talk about the TH1 versus the TH2 response, the TH2 being more towards B cell response, and the TH1 being more towards the cytotoxic T cell response. Um, B cells can operate without CD4 positive T cell help, but really the most efficient and effective B cell responses are made in collaboration with the CD4 T cell because the CD4 T cell will aid the B cell to undergo um, somatic hypermutation, which will increase its affinity for the bug and will also enable the um, B cell to undergo class switch from an IgM response primarily to an IgG or an IgA response. And then the cytotoxic T cells um, are going to be cells which kill um, virally infected cells. Obviously, they could kill tumor cells as well but in this case, virally affected cells, and they would use an MHC class one restricted mechanism. Okay, so if we just look into the B cell response, so what we're talking about when we talk about antibodies, and again, I, this might be very basic, but uh, it helps me to put my talk in context. The B cell makes this very specific structure called the B cell receptor. And this receptor goes through a whole process of genetic editing, and that makes it very highly specific for each pathogen. When the B cell reaches maturity, and especially when it converts into a plasma cell, it can secrete its B cell receptor as an antibody. And there are five classes of those, but really the ones that I'm going to be talking about primarily in this talk are IgM, um, and that's the first one produced. As I mentioned before, it's really low affinity, so it's not doesn't bind very strongly, but it has a high avidity because it has multiple binding sites, about 10 in all, because it's pentameric. IgA, which is major mucosal antibody, and again, this is something which I'm going to touch on a little bit later. And then the one that probably everybody is most familiar with, which is IgG, which is the major memory antibody. Okay, <clears throat> so um, Penny did mention this as well. But just to say that not everything made by the immune system is necessarily good. And that's specifically true for um, some of the viral infections. So we do know that antibodies can facilitate things like uh, viral entry into cells. Um, and that's called um, antibody dependent enhancement, which could facilitate spread and infection. Okay, so that's a little bit about the basic uh, immunology behind it. What is serology testing? So serology testing involves detecting antibodies, including those made by those highly specific B cells. Now, we use serology testing in the laboratory for a number of different applications. We can use them to detect current infection, and often that's an IgM antibody. As I mentioned, IgM is often some of the, the first antibody produced before the class switch. We can also use them to detect past infection, um, current infection, and chronic infection specifically. And uh, that's often an IgG. And often the serology tests that we have detect both IgM for um, acute or recent infection and IgG for um, ongoing past or, or chronic infection. And then we can also use it to detect responses against specific vaccines. And if I was to put together a, a list of some of the vaccine responses that we monitor using serology, I think probably hepatitis B would be at the top there. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, we have quite a lot of experience in South Africa in using serology testing for a number of infectious disease applications, including importantly, uh, HIV infection, where we currently use a fourth generation ELISA. Now, uh, serology tests can be on various platforms. Um, some of the platforms that uh, Penny mentioned are things like ELISAs, um, but we also have um, other, other ways of detecting the antibodies with things like chemiluminescent assays. And then the test can be either manual or they can be automated. Okay, and we also have this. Uh, this thing here, which I'm also going to um, talk about very briefly, which is the point of care antibody test. 
And point of care just means that it's a test that can occur at the patient's bedside or at least very close, so near patient testing. And this is often very convenient because it means you don't have to wait for a result. Uh, you have your finger pricked, for example, uh, the drop of blood is put on the test strip and it comes out often as a, uh, a color band. And, um, and so we, we use these in, in South Africa as well. Um, you might be uh, familiar with HIV rapid test, um, that you'll know that it produces a very clear, easy to read result, but doesn't give you the strength of the result. It just says positive or negative. Okay. So with all of that as an introduction, and having taken half my time with my introduction, uh, let's talk about, uh, about the SARS-CoV-2 antibody response. Okay, so um, one, of the, one of the things that is clear about antibodies in SARS-CoV-2 is that there's nothing clear about antibodies in SARS-CoV-2. Um, so some of the questions that have come up recurrently in the literature are who makes antibodies, which patients, when can you maximally detect antibodies, what do antibodies mean um, for the patient and, and for the, the course of the infection, how long do you keep your antibodies around, um, and I think Penny's um, mentioned some of those um, questions already. Um, which antibodies correlate with protection and where do you make your antibodies? Are all of your antibodies in, for example, the systemic systems? Are they in, in blood? Okay, so um, this is a very busy slide and I apologize for this, but it's kind of is my attempt to answer some of these questions. So um, which antibodies are produced during the seroconversion? So if you make an antibody response, it seems to be fairly clear that you make generally an IgM response followed by an IgG response. And at about the same time that you make the IgM um, or slightly after, you make an IgA response as well. The IgM tends to wane very quickly and IgG occurs later on in infection but tends to be more sustained. And then IgA you make early and that seems to be sustained as well but not necessarily always in the peripheral blood. All right, as, as Penny mentioned, we can detect antibodies against major four structural proteins, and the ones that we often measure are nucleocapsid and the spike protein. Which patients are most likely to seroconvert? Now, um, it's becoming increasingly clear, not just in our study, but in, in studies around the world, that not everybody does seroconvert, or at least not seroconvert in the peripheral blood. Some of the things seem to be more likely to promote antibody formation. And as Penny said, anybody who is sick, um, very symptomatic, um, tends to make a stronger antibody response. We seem to see it more in older patients. And certainly if you've been hospitalized, um, you're more likely to make a very strong response. We're not sure what the impact of comorbidities like uh, HIV and as Johnny mentioned, people with B cell depletion is on, on these antibody responses. And it seems to be that there are a number of, of uh, confounding variables that we're not sure about. When are antibodies produced? So antibodies are often produced quite late relative to the symptoms. And this makes it very difficult for us to, uh, to put them into their proper place because IgM which is the one that we are comfortable with using for acute diagnosis, it's often not detectable before about five days and really peaks at about day seven to 10. IgA about the same time and IgG really only after 14 days and probably in some patients um, about 21 days. And um, again, there, are, there is this uh, idea that not all patients um, will make antibodies and approximately three quarters um, of patients have IgM in the blood and about four fifths of IgG is what we see uh, starting to see in some of these studies. And the final thing is, are the antibodies actually protective? And I'm going to come back to this because um, this is for me a very practical question as 
you are the doctor looking after a patient and you've got an antibody result back on the patient, what do you tell your patient? So it's very unclear. So there's, some of these antibodies appear to be neutralizing. Um, the McCulloch model suggests that there is um, some protection from reinfection if you have high levels or high teters of antibody, but not all antibodies are protective. Seroconversion doesn't always correlate with viral clearance. And not all individuals make all of the antibody responses. So some make against RBD spike and some make against nucleocapsid, um, but not everybody makes against both. Okay, so this is a very familiar picture, I'm sure, to a number of you. And this is from the JAMA article on uh, how the dynamics of the antibody response and the PCR um, dynamics follow each other. So when you're actually infectious, um, unfortunately, at that time, generally both are, are often negative. Um, and then the PCR will become positive. The, there's a decline in PCR positivity in a lot of patients by about 14 days to 21 days. And then the antibody response will start around day 10 um, to day 14 post-symptom onset. Okay, so um, this brings me to, to, to the very controversial um, idea of how do we validate these tests for routine use? And uh, I, I often feel sorry for myself that we ever got involved because it has become a little bit of a controversial um, uh, situation. Now, just to, to put it in perspective, the, the diagnostic realities of COVID-19 testing are that the gold standard for diagnosis, at least acute diagnosis, is the RT-PCR um, test, and it's performed ideally on a nasopharyngeal swab, or at least a mid turbinous specimen. But some of the pr problems are, is first of all, how golden is your gold standard? So there have been a number of questions that have been raised, like issues of contamination and sensitivity issues for the PCR. And remember, the PCR becomes negative around day 14, around the time that the antibody response is starting to develop. How does a PCR test help somebody who thinks they were infected in March? Um, obviously, it doesn't, because by then, hopefully, they've cleared the virus. And then, obviously, the questions uh, regarding how we monitor vaccine responses are also very important. The other problem that we face continuously is that we are competing on the world stage for the PCR test. And uh, there have been a number of countries that have restricted our access to PCR testing. And that's meant that not everybody who wants a PCR test has necessarily got access to getting one. Okay, so serology tests detect antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. Um, and we've had literally uh, hundreds of these tests sent to us for use in South Africa. And a number of individuals, at least since the beginning of this infection and the pandemic across the world, have suggested using these tests to form the basis of what we call the immunity passport. So you had SARS-CoV-2, we know you made antibodies, that means you're no longer infectious. So if you want to go around and go swimming and lick door handles or do whatever you want to do, you can do it because you're now immune. The problem has been the performance of the, of the various assays has not been even across the world. So some of the tests have worked very well and some of them have not. The other problem is that because we don't understand necessarily the response or even what the results mean, it's difficult to explain to your patient or even to understand yourself, for me at least, what a positive antibody test or a negative antibody test actually means. Okay, so so why not? So why not use it for an immunity passport? And um, a collaborator of mine said that there's a country which is actually doing this called Estonia. In Estonia, you have an immunity passport and you get a little sticker if you have antibodies. But the problems with using it for an immunity passport are, first of all, we don't know that antibodies stop you from getting sick again. Certainly not all the antibodies that we measure commercial, from commercial assets. We know that some people who are making antibody responses are still able to um, 
to infect other people. And obviously there might be some equity issues as well because who gets access to these tests? The other problem is, as I mentioned, you're much more likely to produce antibodies if you're symptomatic. So if you're asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic, we think that not everybody will make those antibodies. And if you want to use it for asymptomatic screening, when do you test? Do you test now? Do you test next week? Do you test every week? It's very difficult to, to put that into an algorithm. And then obviously not in diagnostics because in the acute phase at least, first seven days for sure, these tests are often negative even in people who are infected. And in some cases that sensitivity is as low as 11%. There was a major uh, Cochrane review of serological testing, which was published um, recently by Deeks, and they looked at a meta-analysis of 57 studies. Uh, 44 of those studies assessed antibodies only in admitted individuals, and not one of those studies actually focused exclusively on asymptomatic carriers. Now, we're starting to look at those individuals specifically because we're starting to say that possibly as many as 70% uh, as, as or even 80% in some studies of individuals might be asymptomatic. Um, prior to their age, a cumulative sensitivity of 30% for IgM and IgG. So that means one in three um, people were correctly diagnosed using IgM and IgG. 72% prior to day 14, and then much better after day 14 to day 21. And some of the problems with this has been that a lot of these studies that have been done across the world have been done on very small numbers. And the number of, of uh, patients tested after day 21, again, has been very, very small. Um, so just looking at the meta-analysis of, of those data, you'll see that the sensitivity ranges from zero in some studies all the way to 100. And it's very difficult based on that to say what is the best test, what bit test should you do at what time point, and, and how you use these tests optimally. Okay, now I see that some of these suppliers are on the, um, are on the call, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. Um, as it stands, we're currently validating three um, major um, platforms, the Roche and the Abbott and the Euroimmune. Um, the Roche and Abbott both detect antibodies against the nuclear capsid protein. These are extracts from their um, package inserts. And the Euroimmune for spike one protein. Um, so <clears throat> again, the good thing about the nuclear capsid anti antibodies is that they're commonly produced, probably the most commonly produced of all the antibodies, but not necessarily protective in the, in the um, neutralizing antibody sense. Um, this is the reported uh, sensitivity data, uh, and this is again from the package insert from these various assays. And you'll see again, as we've described across the world, that prior to day seven, these tests do not perform very well. Day eight to 13, it improves significantly, and then the reported sensitivity goes to about 100% at day 14 to day 21. Um, just to, again, um, allay some of the anxieties was the specificity. So do these tests cross-react with seasonal coronavirus species, for example? And it seems to be that a lot of these are highly specific. And certainly we found that ourselves, when we've been doing the validations, that these tests have got very high specificities. Um, and, and so generally, if they detect antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, uh, we have a high degree of certainty that you actually had at some point been exposed to SARS-CoV-2. Okay, <clears throat> but as I said, um, those are a lot of the formal assays. Um, there have also been a number of point of care assays, and uh, it's really been uh, what we call the wild west of diagnostics. It's been very exciting for us uh, living on the, the border of point of care because um, everybody, um, I've, I've had a chocolate manufacturers who also manufacture a, a point of care test for SARS-CoV-2. So everybody has really jumped on the bandwagon. And a number of these have been validated in very small studies of five individuals in some cases, um, up to um, 300 and that's generally in ours. So we've been offered um, 
at about 175 at last count to validate, um, and we validated 25 of those, with two of those being approved for further validation and one for conditional approval. All right, so this Wild West has really resulted in a uh, problems around the world. So there was a major uh, recall of uh, COVID-19 antibody tests from the FDA, and there's the FDA recommendation there, as well as a number of articles in the popular press about what the antibody test actually means. And that's resulted in a number of people becoming extremely um, anxious about what their results mean and what they should do. So we are coming towards the end of one of the most comprehensive validations in the world. And what should we be using these tests for now? And I, uh, I feel a lot of um, pressure and anxiety from a number of individuals, including the, uh, some of my colleagues in private laboratories, who said, you know, why do we not just put these tests out there? Let's start using them and find out what they actually mean so that we can uh, build up some experience of using them, being aware that serology assays are never perfect. Um, so we did put together a recommendation, um, and some of these are some of the recommendations that we have put together. So we shouldn't be using it as di diagnosis, at least acute diagnosis, definitely not for immunity passport. Possibly we should be using it for seroprevalence and outbreak surveillance, um, or prognostication in special populations. And then there's some very specific pediatric settings where you should possibly be considering them as well. Right, and then what about into the future? And, and I think Penny did touch on this, but uh, we haven't really looked at T cell responses, um, vaccine responses, we're only starting now to look at those vaccine responses with some of these commercial assays. And then something which I'm very interested in is what about samples other than blood, like saliva, for example? Okay, so that's that was a whirlwind tour, and I, I, I'm very uh, um, worried about time. I just need to thank a number of individuals. So um, as I said, this is one of the most comprehensive um, validation protocols that has ever been done, I think, on, on, on any assays. And uh, there are a number of colleagues who've been um, crucial, including my uh, colleagues in immunology lab, who've run most of the tests, um, uh, Prof. Wendy Stevens and Leslie Scott, um, who've collaborated very heavily. Dr. Carmeli Chetty um, from the NHLS, Kalek uh, Mulsan also from the NHLS, who's chair of the um, laboratory component of the MAC. Uh, Prof. Ian Zanna, who sponsored a lot of the work. Um, all of my collaborators from NICD, Southbrook, University of Cape Town, University of Stellenbosch, the SAMRC, and all the funders. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, uh, for a whirlwind tour of what is a very difficult uh, uh, area and also very topical at the moment. Um, I wanted to to uh, sort of, there have been some questions that have continued for, for Penny, uh, and we are quite short of time, we're sort of five minutes over. Uh, maybe you can just summarize uh, sort of where the process is at the moment. Uh, well, if you know, uh, you mentioned that some are about to be conditionally approved and maybe you do you have any idea of that sort of estimated timeline. And then the other question that I saw coming through is, do you know um, who's conducting or the plan conducting studies for zero prevalence in South Africa? Are there, because one question that we see from David Coffey here was what is the immunity level in SA population? And I guess that, uh, do you know of, you know, who's currently looking at seroprevalence in what areas of South Africa? Um, so to answer your first question, um, as I mentioned, we have um, almost concluded our validations of, of the three formal assays that we mentioned. Um, and those were really waiting on publication of the national testing algorithm um, because the approval is based on the national testing algorithm. So as soon as that's been appropriately approved by the Department of Health, those tests should, should be authorized. Um, I'm subject to correction, but, but that uh, is where I believe the, the tests are currently. Um, also, um, the seroprevalence surveys, so some of them have already taken place or are in, 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 uh, in progress. Um, there has been an anonymous seroprevalence survey conducted by UCT um, through the Department of Virology. 
uh, there is a large seroprevalence survey which is going to be across multiple provinces with the ETA MRC. Um, uh, and Nina Gorga is the PI on that one. Um, there's also a large seroprevalence survey which is going through the HSRC. And that is, uh, is going to be, I think, predominantly in KZN. But uh, again, I'm subject to correction. I'm not sure that that protocol has been uh, concluded. There's some smaller um, hospital based seroprevalence surveys um, which are being conducted in various institutions um, in Gauteng, Limpopo, and uh, the Western Cape predominantly, although I do believe there's an Eastern Cape site as well. And there's also um, a couple of provincial um, seroprevalence surveys which are, I think, have been approved to start. Um, and predominantly in Gauteng and Western Cape. Great, thank you very much. Well, I think we'll um, end there. I think uh, it's just just past the hour. And so it leaves me a great pleasure to thank the two speakers again for excellent presentations um, and to the audience for joining and also to uh, the organizing committee of the South African Immunology Society for, for putting this series together. Uh, and to Iguaba Biotech for sponsoring. Um, and there we've put up the advert. So uh, the next uh, inciting installment of the webinar series will be on Tuesday, 18th of August at the same time slot. Um, and there another very, very topical and exciting uh, discussion point on vaccine development in landscape in South Africa. And we'll have two uh, very well-known and prominent researchers, Prof. Shabir Madi from WITS, and Prof. Ed Rabiki from uh, UCT talking on aspects of vaccines development in South Africa. So thanks very much for everyone's time and hopefully we'll see you all on the Tuesday the 18th. Uh, goodbye.